Factor Show. Episode 164. Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hi, I'm Larry, and on this segment, we are going to expand a bit on the, uh, the piece that Rick did on uh, case gauging your ammunition. So, um, you know, I mean, it's if, if your ammunition is out of spec, it can really ruin your day. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're competing. It's even if it's a local match, you'd like to do well. Um, you know, you're tracking your performance, and and things like ammunition malfunctions can really skew the data, if you will. If you are, uh, if you're really serious about uh, tracking your performance and 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 performing well against your peers. So whether it's a, a major match or a local match, um, that is something that can really, really ruin your day. I mean, that can add, you know, for me, I have uh, ammunition malfunctions so rarely that I'm almost um, just, uh, just flabbergasted when it happens. And I look at my gun, I'm like, what the heck is going on? Like, I, I almost don't, I don't train enough really to clear malfunctions because it rarely happens. So that's something that can add, you know, five seconds, eight seconds to a stage and if you know if everybody else is shooting it in 12 and you're sitting there at uh, almost 20 seconds that'll just totally trash a stage so um, Rick talked about the uh, individual uh, case gauges where your ammunition drops in and is supposed to be flush at the top and um, overall length if, if you're loading the SAMI spec is uh, right there at the bottom of the gauge um, Another thing that this one here, this is from Dylan, by the way, but that's so that's an individual uh, chamber checker or rather a, a case gauge. Something else you can do is, um, as they say, every gun comes with a chamber checker and uh, or a case gauge, and that is the barrel of your gun. Uh, this is the barrel out of my Glock 35. It's a Barstow uh, aftermarket matched barrel, and it's got a very tight chamber. And um, if if the ammunition drops in with a with a plunk, and it dumps out rather easily, then you're good to go. I mean, after all, this this is what it has to fit, right? Um, however, say you've got multiple guns. What do you want to do? Do you want to uh, figure out which barrel is the tightest and use that one? Do you want to check every one of them? Probably not. And and it can be you know kind of a pain in the butt, especially if your gun's dirty. Um, to use this, to use your barrel as your dedicated uh, case gauge. As Rick mentioned, uh, the official case gauges are generally reamed to the minimum SAMI spec dimensions. So if your ammunition fits the gauge, uh, you, you should be good to go in any of your chambers. So we do recommend using the official uh, gauges made for that purpose. Now we've got something new to show off for you. Um, these are the uh, 100 round case gauges. Uh, these are from Ben Steger. He is uh, through his pro shop at bensteger.com is uh, selling these in 9, 40, and 45. And the nice thing about this is that uh, it's not a one at a time. It's a batch process. Uh, it's you can you know grab a whole handful of ammunition, kind of dump it on here, and, and make it so you know the bullets go down. Obviously, and that's the heavy part. So generally they want to go down, but kind of dump them on here, and then you know individually fill in the rest of them. The nice thing about these is they are designed to line up to your ammunition box. So once you've got the ammunition in here you can transfer that to a box which then obviously your bullets are pointing up which is not how we generally like to do it so then you just take a, se a second box and flip them again and then you should be good to go so um, I thought maybe it would be uh, uh, a good demonstration to show you today 
the advantage of using a, a hundo case gauge uh, from bensteger.com. So we're going to see, we're going to do a little race, me versus me, on this versus this, and we'll see how much time we can save. Okay, so first, I'm going to use the individual uh, gauge from Dylan here, and uh, my my technique, my process has always been to drop drop the round in, dump it out, and set it in the uh, in the ammo box. So let's just see how quick we can do this. We've got a, a iPhone here with a stopwatch, and I'm going to get that started as soon as I uh, load the first round. Anything that doesn't gauge, I'm going to set aside on the table and we'll talk about uh, what you can do about that and, and, and whether or not the ammo, if it doesn't gauge, if it doesn't pass the gauge, we'll talk about whether or not it's acceptable to me uh, or not. So we're going to get going here. I've got 100 rounds loaded, uh, 40 caliber to SAMI spec, 1.135 inch overall length, and let's get going. Okay, all right, so now I've got everything boxed, and I'm going to look across the top of all these primers and kind of run my fingers over the top to make sure that the primers are all seated properly. Of course, I don't have an opportunity to do that while I'm racing there with the uh, individual gauge, but all this looks good. Um, just quick glance, you know, quick feel. I don't see any um, any problems with any primers, and we've got one box of 100 rounds that is uh, guaranteed as it can be to uh, to run in the gun for the match. As you see, that was uh, about four minutes, 15 seconds and uh, that's with the individual gauge. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing with the hundo gauge from bensteger.com, his pro shop, and uh, I'm excited to see just how much time I can save to gauge all this ammo. And uh, I'm, you know, <laughs> I don't want to cheat here, I'm just about to get a head start. So let's hit the start button and let's just see how quickly we can gauge all this ammo. All right, there you have it. About half the time, that's uh, two minutes 35. Now, this gauge, I had two rounds to fail the check, so let's just see what's going on with these two guys. Um, last time with the individual gauge, I checked all the primers off the clock, so I'm doing the same thing here, just to kind of make it fair, and uh, these have already been checked, but you know, I just kind of go through the process anyway. So let's see what's going on with these two rounds here. Um, they just barely stick up a little bit. So does that pass muster or not for your purposes? Um, you might want to make these, put these in your practice round bin um, and just, just take them out for your live fire practice. Or um, really, if they're not too terribly tight, for me, um, I feel like 
if you don't have a live live fire practice round bin, or uh, you know you can just uh, check them in your barrel. If you've got, uh, like I said earlier, if you've got just the one one gun, it's easy to get to put that in your barrel. Take the barrel out of the gun. Make sure that they fit in the barrel and. Um, Verify for yourself if you think that that's uh, acceptable. But uh, so we saved about half the time there, two minutes thirty-five, using the Hundo gauge from uh, BenSteger.com's Pro Shop. Go check it out. Welcome to Par Factor. I'm Rick, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a topic that we covered way, way back. You know, we're in our third year. And three years ago, we covered the tactical reload and the retention reload in one of the really early episodes, how to execute those reloads. And then in the episode where we discussed clothing, I went a little bit into how and why I use the clothing that I do, the cover garment and the pants and the equipment that I use as kind of a system, and how I chose that, how it fell out, that it turned out the way it did for me. I just want to discuss that kind of a little more detail, how to select where you put your mag that's come out of the gun when you're doing a retention reload. Now, one of the things about the new rule book, again, here we are, uh, the, the uh, 2013 rule book took effect in October, and so it's been in effect for a few months now, and I think people are kind of filling out how they're doing things a little bit differently than they used to. And one of the things that's come up, and it probably, I don't know how much effect it's gonna have on people who've been playing the game for a while, but the prior rule books all said there are three approved reloads. The slide lock or emergency reload, which you do when the chamber is empty and the mag is empty. Then there were two retention reloads, the tactical reload and the reload with retention. Early versions of the rule book, earlier versions of the rule book, had detailed step-by-step -step descriptions of how each reload was to be accomplished. And the rule book allowed you to specify one or the other. So it was very important to understand the differences between the two. Now the tack load, um, the, the, as it was described in the rule book, when you're performing that reload, the first move you make is to go to your belt to get the reload mag. Then you do the exchange of the magazines at the gun and the spent mag that you've taken out, partially spent or spent mag that you've taken out, has to be stowed before you can fire a shot. So the reload is two trips to the belt. One to get the mag, bring it up to the gun, do the exchange, put the mag away. The reload with retention the first move is to take the magazine out of the gun, stow it, and then draw your reload and bring it up to the gun. Now the obvious advantage in terms of speed is that you just go to the belt once. The mag goes down, the uh, reload mag comes up. Now the tactical thinking, and we hate to talk about tactics when this is a game, the tactical thinking is with the reload with retention, your shot to shot speed is faster. But with the tactical reload, the gun is downloaded for the shortest amount of time. So let's say you've got, you fired a certain number of rounds, you've got say three or four or five or six rounds still in the gun, and you want to reload. So the time that it takes you to go down to your belt and get this magazine and bring it up to the gun, you still have those three or four or five rounds available to you and then the switch of magazines is done just like that. So you're downloaded to the single round in the chamber only for say one second. If you do the reload with retention, as the magazine comes out of the gun, the time it takes you to stow that magazine, get your reload and bring it up to the gun, the gun is downloaded to just the single round in the chamber. So from the competition perspective, I think the reload with retention makes more sense it's got the quicker shot to shot speed. We did another episode earlier about the difference in shot to shot speed uh, between the two reloads and on average um, it was about a second um, for somebody I think who's pretty good at doing the reloads. It's about a second difference between the reload with retention and the tactical reload. But if you're a tactical thinker, you're thinking more along the lines of law enforcement and whatnot, then the idea of having that gun downloaded to a single round 
for just a moment maybe makes more sense. And then the other wrinkle is that the act of stowing the magazine during the tactical reload, the magazine that's come out of the gun, the act of stowing the magazine can be done essentially after the reload. So if you're familiar with the classifier on uh, string two of stage three, you're at the barricade, you fire two shots at each of the three targets, do a reload, and then advance to the barrel and re-engage from the barrel. You're allowed to stow that magazine while you're moving from the barricade to the barrel. And some people have thought, you know, I'm saving a little bit of time by stowing that mag while I'm moving to the barrel instead of completing the reload here behind the barricade before I go. On the face of it, that sort of makes sense. But I really don't think it does because you're, you, while you're standing at the barrel or at the barricade, you've gone to the belt and to the gun, and that's what you do with the reload with retention anyway. When you leave the barricade now, you still have to stow that mech. Now, I have done it both ways. I've shot the classifier over the last 15 years, probably 50 times. And I have found that you can neither run to the barrel as quickly, nor store the mag as quickly as you can do if you do them independently. So I believe that you're faster all the way around to complete the reload while you're standing there at the barricade and then hauling your way up to the barrel with nothing on your mind other than getting there and getting to the shooting position you want to be in when you arrive. Then trying to stow this mag while you're running down towards the barrel, fiddling around, not getting it into your pocket, and then arriving at the barrel and still having that mag in your hand. That's happened to me a couple of times. Um, I've also managed to sort of get it sort of in the area of the pocket, and then when I let go of it, it falls out on the ground. I have to go back and get it. So I just think the, this advantage, this imagined advantage of stowing the magazine while you move really doesn't play out in real life. Um, you just have very few instances where it really is of any value. Um, especially now with the new rule book that says we have two approved reloads. We have the, re the slide lock reload or emergency reload, empty chamber, empty mag, or we have the tactical load which takes all the different permutations how, however you like to do your reloads that end up with the magazine retained, all of those different scenarios are now lumped under, under the name tactical reload. So if you're working under the new rule book here in the tail end of 2013 and going forward, you don't have to take you don't have to use any particular sequence to get your gun loaded. It just has to be loaded and the mag stowed before you fire a shot. And so I would suggest that you practice, a person who practices either or any type of reload is going to be better off than someone who doesn't practice. But if you have limited practice time, I would say pick a type of reload and practice that one and become really good at it. And I would recommend the reload with retention as it was spelled out in the older rule books. And um, then, you, then as you're trying to decide, well, geez, okay, I, I, I decided I want to do the reload with retention. The first move is to take that mag out of the gun and stow it. So where do you stow that magazine? Now a tip from way back when, I think it was Rick's, here's a tip series that maybe thankfully is uh, kind of run its course. Um, I made mention of never putting a downloaded magazine back into your pouch. Now, I know there are some people who think, well, you know, where would I expect to find a magazine other than in the pouch? You know, I mean, every time I do a reload, I reach to my pouch. So why wouldn't I want to put the magazine back into the pouch where it came from? Well, one, the pouch is pretty hard to get the mag into. The pouch is supposed to hold the uh, magazine securely. It's not that easy to fit it back in there. Secondly, someday, if you put a downloaded or empty mag in that pouch, you will forget to reload it. And on the next course of fire, you'll run out of rounds. You'll get a penalty for starting the course of fire with a magazine not loaded to capacity. You may get another penalty, um, you know, depending on how the lack of ammo screws up your uh, approach to your course of fire. You may end up with a miss, failure to neutralize, etc. 
because you were short those rounds. So save yourself the trouble and heartache and do not put a depleted magazine back in the pouch. So where do I put it? Well, you've got a number of options, none of which are above the waist. Um, you cannot use upper pockets, whether you're using a, a pocketed t-shirt or a, a regular button-up shirt with a pocket or a vest with pockets. The magazine cannot go in these upper pockets. There were some uh, gamesters back in the late 90s they would prop this pocket open, they would you know, put little wires on it and stuff to hold it open, they'd eject the magazine right into the pocket, and you know, that was kind of determined to be not uh, quite cricket. So you can no longer, it's been many years now, uh, stow a magazine above, essentially above the waist. So your options though are still fairly broad. Um, you're wearing a number of garments I have on some cargo pants, uh, fairly conventional, uh, slash pockets in the front, um, just regular, um, not really patch pockets, but patch style pockets with a horizontal opening in the back and then a big uh, bellows pocket on each leg. And then I've got my vest, which has pockets on each side and front. And then you also have the option of using the belt, um, actually sticking the magazine in here between the belt uh, and your shirt. And so, uh, trying to come up with the best place and the best way to do it. Now also remember, in other episodes, I've discussed how a lot of times when you practice, you sort of practice for the ideal. So when you'll see people practicing reloads, they'll essentially be standing like this and they'll do their reloads and everything is exactly where it's supposed to be and accessible, they're standing upright, but you'll find yourself in IDPA often reloading when you're on your knees or reloading when you're sitting. Um, and so you have to be a little bit flexible and kind of think ahead about where do I want that mag to go or you might end up having the mag in your hand thinking, you know, geez, where does it go? And that's one of the other reasons why I, I, I always suggest pick a technique and practice it, not just because you'll become good at it, but because it eliminates doubt or it eliminates confusion. The last thing you want to be doing is you pull the mag out of the gun and think to yourself, Oh, am I doing a tack load or a reload with retention? Does the, this mag go back in the gun? You know, I mean, that's kind of an exaggeration. But I've actually found myself at the barricade shooting the classifier with a mag in my hand and not really sure which mag is it. You know, is this the one that goes in the gun or is this the one that goes in the belt? Because I hadn't in advance decided, am I going to do the tactical reload or am I going to do the reload with retention? I've been doing both. And so by eliminating one or the other, it's always going to be the same. The mag comes out of the gun and you've got to stow it. So where does it go? Now the problem, I would say, if you look at pictures of shooting IDPA, uh, everybody, a large proportion of people are wearing a vest. Um, initially they were fishermen's vests or photographer's vests. They were uh, festooned with pockets. They hung low enough to cover the holstered gun and uh, it was popular, I think, to take that mag and stick it in one of these outer pockets in the vest, then go for your reload to complete, uh, to complete the reload. The problem, I think, with that is, well, what kind of pockets do you have? And this is, again, something I touched on. I'm a lefty, so when I pull that mag out of the gun, I'm going to want to put it on the right side. Well, this vest is clearly made for right-handed shooters. It's got a very large bellows uh, style cargo pocket on the left side where a right-handed person could get their gun, uh, their magazine in there pretty easily. But on the right side it has what looks like a couple of what look to me like magazine pouches for M16 magazines or something. They're fairly small pouches. Um, I can get my hand in it, um, but it's not the kind of thing that I want to be fishing around for the opening of this for the same reason I don't want to be fishing around for the opening of my magazine pouch. It's just a little bit too small and I don't really like it. The other problem, of course, is my magazines are underneath this cover garment. So if I'm going to take the magazine from the gun, we'll get a magazine, if I'm going to take the magazine from the gun and stow it, even if I'm really adept at getting it into this pocket, now I've got my hand here on the outside of my vest, when where I need it is inside my vest so I can get my reload out. So even though I see a lot of people wearing vests, I occasionally wear this vest. You can see it's got my name on it, so you know it's my vest. I really don't like it as a cover garment um, because it's kind of heavy. 
uh, in, depending on bad weather, uh, I'm going to have a coat or something on anyway. So it's kind of heavy, a little more insulation than I like. Um, and then I'm not using it to stow my mags. I'm going to use my pockets on my pants to stow the mags. Now the example that I used in the older episode two years ago talking about where, uh, where to put the mag and the design of your clothing, I really like the uh, 511 style pants where you have a slash pocket on the front and the back and they meet on the center uh, seam of the pants. Now with the, uh, with the new rule book, we've had a little bit of a change in where you're allowed to place your magazine pouch. It used to be the leading edge of the pouch had to be behind the body center line. So you would see people, this pouch, uh, that's probably still too far forward to be legal prior to October um, of 2013. You're allowed to skip some belt loops if necessary to get it where you want it. This is pushed up against the belt loop here and it's still not far enough back. Okay, the new rules as of 20, October 2013 are that the magazine can be worn in a position that's essentially identical to what has been the case in USPSA production uh, for many years, and that is the leading edge can be up to the hip bone. It's the, the anatomical name is, is something iliac, something is spelled out in the rule book, but essentially it's find your hip bone and you can push the magazine that far forward. And, and uh, that can have an effect on access to your pockets uh, which pocket you want to go to. When I was wearing uh, my mags back in this position that was legal before, the magazine pouch was essentially right over um, this rear slash pocket on the 511s. With it pushed forward now to the hip bone location, it's more over the front slash pocket. And so when you're doing uh, your tack reload or your reload with retention, it's probably a little bit handier now to go to this front pocket and then come out with the reload mag. Uh, just something to consider when you're shopping for clothes. I mean, that's one of the things. I would go to the store and I would think, uh, okay, uh, my ensemble is like a, you know, a system. Everything's got to work together. The pants, you know, have to, the belt has to hold my pants up. It's got to hold the gun. It's got to hold the mags. All that stuff has to be secure. And it has to be where I want it. Um, uh, under the old rule book, of course, the, the belt loop is specifically said that the belt had to pass through all the loops. To make it a little bit easier on us, it was updated, uh, I think, a year or two ago, allowing you to skip some belt loops. So let's say, for instance, the belt loop that was immediately under the holster or the one that was immediately under your mag pouch, you could skip it. Um, and that way you could adjust your pouch and your holster um, without having to take into account the location of the uh, belt loops. And that's one of the things when I would go shopping for pants, my first consideration when I used to use a one and three quarter inch belt was that the pants would accommodate a one and three quarter inch belt. Most jeans do, most kind of hard work pants do, but a lot of slacks and things that are more in that direction will only take a one and a half inch belt. So be sure you can get your gun belt um, through the loops on the pants that you're intending to wear. Uh, the loop location isn't as important as it used to be because you can skip some, uh, skip some loops. Uh, but then uh, you also want to be uh, con concerned yourself with where are these pockets, what kind of pockets are they, um, uh, slash pockets, the flat pockets and whatnot, uh, so that you can uh, do the reload the way you want to do it and stick with it. I mean, I find myself sometimes throwing on a pair of pants that I rarely wear. Like the, I, I, have, I actually have this pair of pants that I was going to call. These are my shooting pants. But they have a uh, flat pocket back here. And, and I just thought, you know, if I ever want to try to get something in there, that flap is going to be in the way. So I would suggest, you know, when you're shopping for your shooting clothing or any clothing, uh, be, be mindful of how that's going to work with, with your uh, system of clothing and how compatible is it with your uh, reloading, uh, your chosen reloading. Uh, style and then where do you want to put those magazines that you've taken out of the gun when you've performed your retention reload I, I have you know kind of poo-pooed the idea of using the vest because you've got to go into the vest and then also go to the belt to get the magazine but you don't actually have to use a pocket either um, some people will put the magazine they'll stick it here in, in front um, if you can stick it between your belt 
on your gut here in front. Um, again, when you're reloading, be mindful that you might be down on your knees, you might be sitting. Um, if you're trying to reload while sitting in a car or simulated sitting in a car, it might not be all that easy to get it in here. Um, some people have uh, advocated putting the magazine in the small of the back. Now, if you're reloading while you're on your knees, that's not a bad idea. Um, most people have a natural little uh, um, kind of a uh, concave area in the small of their back that uh, the belt will actually be held away from it naturally and it creates a little pocket in there right in the center of the small of your back. You can stick the mag in there and it's easier to get at when not so much when you're standing. I mean, if I'm just standing here, I'm going to go for the pocket. But if you're kneeling, um, it's not a bad way to go. And again, if you're sitting, uh, that opens up another kind of a weird scenario because if you're used to dropping it into this pocket when you're standing, well, of course, if you're sitting, that pocket's not really available to you. Um, likewise, with your hip pocket, you're sitting on it, you know. And so think of uh, these different scenarios that are going to come up. And maybe uh, in those situations, the vest isn't the bad place to go because the vest is not, you're not going to be sitting on it, you're not going to be kneeling on it. Under those conditions, the vest might be might be the way to go, but I don't know that I would um, put that requirement, the requirement for having it easily accessible when I'm sitting or kneeling or standing, um, as the primary choice. But it is something to consider. I've been shooting IDPA now for almost 15 years, and I've decided it doesn't come up often enough that I want to use the vest as my primary place to put it. But it still is an option. Um, if, if it becomes necessary due to the circumstances. Uh, just be mindful that if you're going to practice something, you're going to get to the point where you're always going to that same spot. And then if you find yourself in a situation like, again, if, I, if, if I'm, this is my spot, my front pocket, I'm sitting in the car and now I'm trying to get it in there, that's not going to be the place to put it. So having an alternate is good. But again, I would focus on um, Having the one best spot, practice that, maximize that, and if you have a situation that comes up where you need to find some kind of an alternate uh, place to put that mag, worry about that at the time.